Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. <clears throat> I don't have the benefit today of the class of 62 podium that goes up and down, so you all can see me over here and, okay. But I'm not the most important person here in the room. Oh, you can see me up there too. Um, but I do have the distinct pleasure of introducing our two speakers for today. Before I do so, <clears throat> hello. Before I do so, I'm just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping, which should sound familiar to many of you, although I see a lot of new and friendly faces in our audience. Um, the housekeeping includes that <clears throat> for those of you who are here in the room, we're so glad you're here and enjoying lunch. We will have uh, at the conclusion of today's session, hopefully some time for questions and answers and dialogue. Um, and I would encourage you just to hold those questions until the end. For those of you who are attending on Zoom, uh, please do use the Q&A function to let us know what's on your mind throughout the course of the presentation, and we will moderate a discussion at the end, including your comments and questions. For everybody, both those of you on Zoom as well as here in person, we'll have a, an evaluation and a QR code at the conclusion of the session. That really does a couple of things. Number one, gives us feedback about today's presentation and grand rounds, but number two enables you to receive continuing education credit for the session. I'm a little out of breath because this is farther than class of 62. Okay. I only have like 25 inches of inseam also to move me throughout the medical center. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce uh, two speakers today. Um, many of you will know at least one of them, maybe multiples. So I'll start actually with Dr. Snyder. Uh, Dr. Allison Snyder is a senior clinical fellow in the neurogenetics branch in the neuro neurodegenerative clinic, okay? Um, she joined the NIH after completing her clinical fellowship in behavioral neurology at UCSF in their Memory and Aging Center. Um, her clinical expertise is in dementia with a particular focus on primary progressive aphasias. Her research focuses on <clears throat> understanding genetic contributions to dementia by establishing a pipeline to evaluate variants of uncertain significance identified in the clinic, as well as studying the role of genetic modifiers on microglial biology. I don't even know what that means. Okay. Okay, good. That's not the topic for today. Uh, she received her medical degree here from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry in 2014 internship uh, and neurology residency at the University of Maryland Medical Center, uh, that fellowship at UCSF and a research fellowship at the NIH. At the NIH. Uh, and then second, but certainly not least, Dr. Larry Guttmacher, uh, whose notoriety extends across many domains of our community and of our learning of this department and of this institution. He's an emeritus professor of psychiatry and medical humanities here at the University of Rochester co-founder of the Real Minds Film Festival, uh, did not only one, but two tours as a program director of the psychiatry residency, which I might be unprecedented, I don't know. Um, but he, more importantly, is a quintessential teacher. Anybody who's ever interacted with Larry uh, knows uh, in their hearts his love of teaching, whether it's engaging the public around uh, mental illness, mental health awareness, um, our faculty development here at the university, within our department, with our residents, with our learners, with patients. Um, and actually, I think what you'll experience today in our grand rounds is that he's extending that love for and commitment to teaching here with all of us today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Guttmacher. Microphone might need a little adjustment. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Zipporah. Um, this one's going to be a little different. And, and first, I, I want to thank Allison for coming up here. Uh, I, I really appreciate this. I'm not going to bury the lead here. Um, I am doing this because I have Lewy body disease. And I'm going to talk about what the journey so far with this has been like. Um, obviously, this is an ongoing story. Uh, and it's going to continue to evolve. But I've learned a lot um, in this process, um, and I want to share a little bit about what it's been like. So 
how this began. Uh, maybe two and a half, three years ago, I had this sudden realization that my beloved, that Terry, knew more about the Boston Celtics than I did. And Terry doesn't care nearly as much about the Boston Celtics as I do. So somehow she was retaining this information that I hadn't. And it then became necessary to try to figure out what was going on. So at that point, I'm now 76. At that point, um, I think my life was going really very well. Uh, I was at that point uh, in my second tour as residency director. Uh, I was very much enjoying the opportunity to work with the residents, to teach residents and medical students. I was working at St. Joe's um, a Neighborhood Center and enjoying that work a great deal. I was very active physically, um, spending a lot of time out uh, hiking and in nature, as I so enjoy, playing basketball three days a week, um, uh, had a wonderful family, and life was basically going quite well. But I noticed that I was simply not encoding new information in the way that I always had. Um, stuff that was well learned, I was fine on. But new stuff simply was not registering in the same way. So, uh, and I wanted a little contrast. In the audience is my baby brother, Alan. Uh, Alan, 24 years ago, uh, had a major cardiac event, wrote a piece um, in JAMA, writing about that. And I want to contrast a little bit his experience and mine. And I also followed in his footsteps. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is in the current issue of, of Lancet Psychiatry, um, where I talk a little bit about this journey. So we'll, we'll get back to Alan and that story. So the second moment that struck me was the whole issue of denial. I'm good at that. And it was real easy to try to shove this under the carpet and to not pay attention to what was going on. So it really took a sort of force of will and sitting down with Terry and sharing with her my worry about what was going on. And lo and behold, she had been noticing some of the same things. And um, it was necessary to start paying attention. I'm still working at St. Joe's and I wanted to continue doing that and felt that I was still competent to do that. So I talked to Sheila Briotti, who's here and Bill Small, who may or may not be here, and Bill is there and um, let them know my worry and ask them to keep an eye on my clinical work because I felt ethically I needed to make sure that somebody was making sure that I was not doing things I shouldn't be doing. And so they kept an eye on me and things continued for a while to be okay. But now I'm starting to face this and um, uh, it's time to really start paying attention. So I reached out to Anton Thorstensen and, um, and got uh, Anton, who has been an old friend, um, to uh, agree to start caring for me and to help me figure out what was going on. So lesson number three is expect to be humiliated. Uh, so I get the beginning of a neuropsych workup and the same exams that I've given hundreds, if not thousands of times, you know, the minute man of state exam. Damn, you know, I'm a 22. Uh, and that certainly is not what I would have thought. 
Uh, so that's consistent at that point with mild cognitive impairment. And clearly, um, I need to really do this right. And I start talking to some of my close friends, many of them like contemporaries. And it's interesting in terms of the reaction you first get, um, which was almost universally, well, gee, I got problems with my memory too. Um, I'm not so good with names. And, and, you know, sort of their denial was going on top of my denial at that stage. Um, and, and throughout this, you know, um, I present reasonably well to the world. Uh, my vocabulary is still what it was. My social skills are not much worse than my baseline. Um, and uh, so it's not real obvious uh, to most folks. And so their denial continued to operate, which sort of fed into mine, but you know, at this point, I've really got to pay attention to what's happening. I will say with some pride as an example of what I've retained that on spelling being the New York Times, I do make Queen Bee with some regularity. Okay. I'm good. There was one day when I failed to be a make genius, I had COVID. I called Alan, Alan said I needed a note from my doctor. Um, so it's clear something bad is happening. And, and at that stage, that was probably for me, the bottom and the toughest part. Um, sleep became very difficult. I found myself preoccupied and, and really unable to think about much else. Um, it really started to consume very much of, of my time, and of me at that point. So um, it's time to confront it at this point. And here's where privilege starts to show. And I have been incredibly privileged in the way that I have been able to deal with this is very much a function of the privilege that I have. Um, it turns out that uh, one of Alan's closest friends is was the director of NIH. And if you call Francis Collins and say, I'm worried, and Francis then calls the NINDS folks, and I think it may have taken about eight seconds for me to get a call back. <laughs> um, and then I go down, this is where um, I really get to work with Allison, which is, has been an incredible, incredible privilege. And Allison leads a three-day, utterly wonderful workup. Um, the kind of workup that you would get if you didn't worry about needing to get authorization and you could do anything you wanted and you could spend all the time you wanted with somebody. And uh, part of it uh, was finding out that my alpha synuclein ain't what it ought to be and that the diagnosis uh, then becomes cinched uh, of Lewy body. Most everybody in this room knows about that. I've got some friends out on Zoom and just the, the one, two sentence synopsis. What this means is a very inevitably sort of progressive um, cognitive decline, typically ac accompanied by Parkinson's. Um, I, so far, my Parkinson's has been, relatively speaking, quite mild. Um, and uh, that has been good news for the home team uh, that I have enjoyed. So this kind of privilege that I had of getting this uh, wonderful workup and there was a curious reaction. So Allison delivers the bad news to Terry and to me. Um, now, part of it was she delivered it so well, but 
I felt this weird sense of relief that now I know what it is. There's a name, it's not a good name. Um, it's not like this is loaded with good news, but I know what I'm up against. And, and that um, really relieved me greatly. And that began a period of, of sort of things gradually have gotten better and better. Uh, you remember I said how I was at one point sort of totally preoccupied with this, and that is no longer the case. Do I think about it a lot? Sure. Um, but I've got plenty of room in my life for other things, uh, which I continue to do. So in a sense, that was a bit of a healing process. But I kept it undercover until very recently. And obvious question, why am I doing this? Um, well, part of it was reading an absolutely wonderful piece that was in the Boston Globe, written by a professor at the College of the Atlantic, where he wrote about his Alzheimer's. And he wrote um, that he is continuing to teach. COA has been wonderful to him. As I should add, Ben, was with me um, and that, you know, it's clear that I want to continue to do things as long as I am able to do them reasonably well um, and got the kind of support. And, and then what, what Steve Wessler argued in this paper was that to not talk about it was to accept a kind of stigma and that instead of that, it's important to be out front, to let the world know, and to continue to contribute um, as, as you do this. So that's why I'm subjecting all of you to this <laughs> uh, as, as part of that process. There's a contrast. You know, again, Alan wrote this piece where he writes about, felt no hesitation to write about his MI. I waited. Um, to do so. Uh, there is a stigma about illnesses affecting the brain that we don't seem to have about other organs. And from my perspective, that's unfortunate. So um, I want to tell one other story. When, when I first came on faculty, I ran the ECT service. And there was a absolutely wonderful older senior clinician. And what became apparent was that he was starting to lose it. And with incredible trepidation, I felt that I had to sit down with him and talk about this and figure out where to go. And I will never forget his grace, he thanked me. He decided it was time to stop and he did. Um, and his acceptance was for me a kind of model. So part of my pitch, I wanna to continue to do what I can. I'm gonna rely on you guys to let me know <laughs> if, there's time where I should stop. Um, but I want to continue to contribute as much as I can. Um, we talked about this title is, is biology destiny. And, you know, so I'm going to argue, yeah, and no. Yeah, it's destiny. I mean, you know, it's clear what's going to happen with me but it's also clear that I can maintain a whole lot of control over my life as part of this. Um, how does one advance slides here? Does this do this? Oh, we were supposed to do this. Yeah, you've seen that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Ain't nobody making no money off of this. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So this is my life now. This is uh, off of our front lanai in Hawaii. So this is the westernmost part of the United States, Nihau, the island that you're looking at, the sun setting. I spent a lot of time down in Seneca Lake. This is me, me and my boys. Uh, we finished number four in the country in the 75 and over national tournament. Next summer, we're going to medal. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I continue to play ball three days a week. Uh, this is me three days ago, uh, hiking in Greece uh, on the island of Kithara in front of one of the caves. Um, and I want to continue to do this kind of stuff, and I want to continue to teach, and I want to continue to be part of life uh, as long as I can do it. And I want to use this as a kind of teaching moment. So I thank you guys for bearing with it. And now some science. <laughs> so. so first should adjust again. <laughs> uh, I wanna say it's a real honor um, to be here and be part of this day. Um, not just for the homecoming sake, but also um, to be part of the teaching moment. So thank you for having me. Um, today, we're going to talk about biomarkers and neurodegeneration, a little bit more of a scientific then, but I promise we'll get to the philosophical parts too. Um, so as I was putting together this talk, I will say that the first time I said the word biomarkers at the NIH, I was handed a book that's 63 pages from the FDA about the definition of biomarkers. And I hope none of you walk away as scarred as I was from that experience. Um, but I was thinking a little bit about the word destiny. And I came across this quote from Wilder Penfield, who was a neurosurgeon practiced both in Canada and the United States. Um, he's probably most famous for uh, mapping out the homunculus, um, but it turned out that his real passion in life was to find the structural essence of the human soul. And he said, the brain is the organ of destiny. It holds within its humming mechanism secrets that will determine the future of the human race. Thought that was a perfect setting for today. So as I was putting together this talk, I was thinking about the proverb of the blind men and the elephant. And this tells us a little bit about the importance of perspective. So the person who's standing at the elephant's tail says, aha, it's a rope. The person at its foot says, ah, it's a tree trunk. The person at its body says, oh, a wall. The person at its ears, a fan. The person at its tusks, a spear. And the person at its trunk, a snake. So a lot of how we take things depends on our perspective. And I think this maps on a little bit to how we think about biomarkers today. Um, we're often blinded by what's directly in front of us. So I'm gonna try and zoom out a little bit during this talk so that we can keep a, an important perspective on, on the bigger view of things. All right, so I'm gonna go through three points. Um, why is it that we care about biomarkers and neurodegenerative diseases? Uh, what does a positive biomarker mean? And a little bit about some changing definitions in the field. Um, and then lastly, probably most importantly, is biology really destiny? So here we go. Um, first off, how do biomarkers help us in the clinic? So when I have a patient sitting in front of me, many of the syndromes that I deal with day in and day out are quite ambiguous. There's a list of symptoms that could be attributed to many different things. And so shown here is, um, shown in the graphic is uh, the example of cortical basal syndrome. So a distinct clinical entity can be caused by many different underlying diseases um, and uh, including Alzheimer's disease, including typical frontotemporal dementia pathologies um, of CBD and PSP and a whole host of other things. Um, more common conditions like mild cognitive impairment 
Only about half of those are due to Alzheimer's disease, even though we sort of typically associate those two. Um, and even syndromes like behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia that are fairly classic and um, the pathology is fairly well described, about 15% of those cases aren't due to an FTD at all, but they're actually due to Alzheimer's disease. And so in this setting, the tool of a biomarker helps give us diagnostic clarity. The other thing that it does is it helps improve accuracy. So over a quarter of individuals who are diagnosed clinically with Alzheimer's disease don't actually have that disease when we look under the hood or in their brains. 20% of patients with Parkinson's disease don't have any evidence of alpha-synuclein. Um, and this is much higher when we delve into rarer conditions or other atypical presentations, frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy body, um, and other um, variants of these disorders. Um, and so this is a sort of depiction of that on the far right side, you see the classic clinical syndromes and then where they map out in terms of their underlying pathology. So when you have a test in hand to be able to say what the disease actually is, it helps improve our accuracy as well. So another way of thinking about this is that our classic clinical syndromes actually have a wide range of underlying pathologies. And so it's quite complicated and having a test can help clear things up. The other way that biomarkers have really revolutionized how we practice in neurodegeneration is that it helps improve prognostication. And this is important because one of our jobs as physicians is to guide our patients and to have the most information in hand gives the best information about what's to come, which I think, um, as Larry could probably attest to, is a really powerful thing, especially as the stigma around these diagnoses help, makes people feel helpless. And so the more information you can give them, the better. What we know is that individuals with mild cognitive impairment, for example, who have positive evidence of Alzheimer's disease pathology, they're more likely to progress to dementia and they're more likely to do so faster. And so that's very valuable information. When someone has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease already, if they also have evidence of Lewy body disease, we know that those cases progress faster, have higher functional impairment, et cetera. And so this is just to illustrate that when we have the information that biomarkers provide us, it helps us guide patients better. And lastly, from a clinical perspective, the use of biomarkers helps inform treatment strategies and identify appropriate clinical trials. Um, so I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about the use of biomarkers in research and why this is important. Uh, between 2004, this is an example from the Alzheimer's field. So between 2004 and 2021, there were over 2,500 clinical trials. There were over 500 of which were interventional in phase two and three. 98 of them failed. 50 of these failed trials were phase three, so those really, really big clinical trials with hundreds, if not thousands of patients, and over a third of them did not include any biomarkers. So going back from a couple of slides, you'll recall that even when someone is clinically diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, sometimes more than a quarter of the time, they don't have that disease. And so when we look at why these trials fail, sometimes it's not because the drug doesn't work, but because the patient doesn't have the problem. And so this is an illustration of how we can use biomarkers to really improve how we're doing clinical trials so that we're not missing effective treatments, which I think is something that we all hope for in this space. So from a research utility perspective, this, uh, the use of biomarkers helps us identify who are most likely to benefit from a therapy. Also may be important when thinking about whom we might not want to give these therapies to. Um, there's some evidence from the monoclonal antibody trials in Alzheimer's disease that individuals with comorbid pathology with Lewy body disease have a different reaction. Um, there's, this is obviously early days in that space, so I think there's a lot to be learned, but something to keep in mind. Um, and also biomarkers help us know, are the drugs doing what we think they're doing? So if you're targeting amyloid and you have a way of measuring amyloid and your drug is lowering amyloid, then you should be able to see that in your biomarker. So it just makes overall for better trial design. All right, so talked a little bit about why it is that we care and how we use these both in the clinic and the research space. 
Next, I'm gonna talk about what a positive biomarker means. And really this portion of the talk is gonna focus on a shift that's happening in the neurodegenerative space where we're starting to define diseases by the biomarkers. And we'll talk a little bit about the controversy there as well. So Alzheimer's disease is defined by its biology and the clinical presentation alone is not diagnostic. Let's walk through this. So the disease itself, what I'm referring to is the beta amyloid plaques and the tau tangles that we see under a microscope. They appear years, if not decades before someone has any kind of symptoms at all. And cognitive impairment is not necessary to diagnose someone with the disease. So in living people, the disease is diagnosed by disease specific biomarkers. And it's also important to keep in mind that the AD clinical syndromes, as we talked about before, up to a quarter or more of them are caused by other diseases. Um, and conversely, the same biology, so Alzheimer's disease can have many different manifestations. So there's a language variant, there's a visuospatial variant, there's a frontal variant, there's a behavioral variant. So these are all ways in which the symptoms and the disease aren't always mapped one-to-one. -one. All of this is to say that Alzheimer's disease is really a continuum and it's not a discreetly defined entity. And so this led to the um, proposal last summer um, for a new set of diagnostic criteria that really put four biomarkers at the center of the diagnosis. Um, and so on the left column, you'll see imaging-based biomarkers. On the right column, you'll see fluid-based biomarkers. These include a mixture of those from the uh, CSF or cerebrospinal fluid, as well as those from plasma um, at varying stages of um, clinical validity. Uh, so at the heart of the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, now we've placed the core underlying pathology. So markers for amyloid and tau. Next tier, we include the markers of the biological response to that pathology, um, things like neurodegeneration, which we can see on imaging and also measure in fluid, um, and the um, resultant inflammation, which we can measure in the fluid as well. And the other thing that's baked into this new diagnostic criteria are biomarkers that look at non-Alzheimer's pathology that can come along and ultimately alter someone's disease course. These include vascular injury and alpha-synuclein. So how do we use this? First, we diagnose the disease by looking for the core pathology, amyloid and tau. We stage the disease and talk about prognosis and indications of treatment effect by looking at the effect of that biology on neurodegeneration and on inflammation. And we identify other processes that contribute and change someone's disease course. And so what this has allowed us to do is map out the expected trajectory for someone clinically. They will march through the stages in a very predictable fashion. And we can map this out also um, through work done by Cliff Jack and others, we now have actually very precise understanding of which biomarkers change when and how over time. And so this is actually very well established. So there's a an, an set trajectory for this disease. Some people though, don't follow the textbooks and they have faster clinical decline. And this would be an indication that there's some other process going on. Some people have a slower clinical decline. And this too is an indication that there is another process going on, but a different one. Um, and this speaks to the uh, concept of cognitive reserve. So those of us who have preserved cognitive function um, in spite of underlying pathology, and there's a lot of interest in this. There was just a uh, article in the paper the other day about super agers. Um, so this is an area of uh, a lot of interest in the field um, and other resilience factors and um, genetic reasons why someone may be uh, less susceptible to the effects of pathology despite having the um, changes in their tissue. So this has been adopted beyond the Alzheimer's space um, in the field of um, alpha-synuclein Lewy body disease. And it's now uh, the newest proposal terms this neuronal synuclein disease. So this was Tanya Samuni's group. Um, they just published this earlier this year. And they too have decided that we should put the core pathology at the heart of this diagnosis. So to make a diagnosis, they're looking for evidence of the pathognomonic neuronal alpha-synuclein deposits, 
evidence of dopaminergic dysfunction. They look at genetic risk and how that modifies someone's disease. Um, there are some variants that confer additional risk and there are some variants um, that are um, deterministic. So if you have this variant, you will absolutely develop disease. Um, and lastly, they look at whether or not someone has functional impairment. And so just to map this out, they've put um, for stage one and two, first you have the pathological change, then you have clinical signs and symptoms, and then in the later stages of disease, functional impairment starts to show up. So here we have two examples of two different diseases that have really baked into their uh, conceptualization of the disease biomarkers. Um, at the same time as Tanya Samuni's group published their paper, Gunter Hoglinger um, and others published this synergy model, um, which is a little bit different. It looks at individuals with symptoms and then grades them based on the presence or absence of pathology. But here too, we see that measures of alpha synuclein, so the pathognomonic changes that occur with this disease are really placed at the heart of the diagnosis. And so all of this represents a paradigm shift. In classic neurology, it was all about phenomenology. The dogma, even when I was in my fellowship, was that you had one symptom and it was one disease. You could get one protein and you just had to pick which one. It could be amyloid, it could be tau, it could be TDP43, it could be alpha-synuclein, but it was just one. Um, and pathology itself is, is a post-mortem practice, but we now have in vivo measures and so definitions of disease are changing to incorporate underlying biological process, regardless of whether or not someone has symptoms. And what this allows for is a more complex understanding of disease and also the appreciation of the presence and contributions of multiple pathologies. However, this was not met very warmly in the public press. Um, so pretty much every major news outlet um, had articles about the controversy of defining disease without symptoms. And so that got me thinking about our last point. Why is it that people were so upset that we're now calling a disease in someone who doesn't have symptoms? What is it about um, this that had people so riled up? And this may not surprise you in the room, but it turns out dementia is the most feared diagnosis in individuals over age 65. And I think a lot of that, I was you know, sort of reflecting on this, why, why might that be the case? And I think a lot of that is reflective in, in even how we conceptualize the disease, which is that there is a very well-defined expected trajectory for someone who has this diagnosis and this sense that once you've been put on this path, this decline is somehow inevitable um, and people get a sense of hopelessness. And I think that this is supported by even our cultural conceptualizations of dementia. So going back to old folklores like Baba Yaga and others, how we even portray dementia as always in this negative light. Um, this very um, inevitable, people suffer from it, um, always using negative terminology. And it really is driven by this sense of hopelessness that there's nothing to do about it. And so I think, you know, going back to this image, it is true that there is an expected clinical decline. And it is true that some people progress faster. But what this concept has ignored is that there is a whole bottom half to this chart, a whole set of individuals and, um, and factors that alter disease course. And so what is it that we can do to take control of our destiny? First, we're going to turn to mouse models. Um, as I said, this is a disease model. And if I stood up in front of you and told you that we cured Mouseheimer's, you should all laugh in my face because we've done it hundreds of times and it very rarely translates to humans. Um, but looking at mouse models of disease can help tell us things. And so this was just published in Nature um, a couple of weeks ago, um, looking at treadmill training in mice. And they were able to see that just treadmill training alone helps increase the transcription of genes that are related to neuroplasticity. And so exercise changes our biology and we can measure that. And that's important in the context of these diseases. The other um, paper that came out looked at 
standard Alzheimer's mouse models, which are fairly inbred, um, and simply crossed them with other mouse lines that were less inbred to increase genetic diversity. And this increase in genetic diversity helped decrease plaque burden, neuronal damage, and inflammatory responses in mouse models. And so what this tells us is that there are genetic factors as well that help mitigate response to um, and the evolution of pathology. All right, so as I said, you should laugh in my face if I talk to you more about Mouseheimer's. I'm gonna move on to my favorite experimental model, which is the human. Um, we have lots of evidence of how changes in humans can help alter disease course. And so let's um, first have to establish that this has been observed, that modifiable risk factors are associated with dementia. Um, and so this one study looked across broad populations. Um, so some of science is plagued by um, me centered research um, or um, research focused on um, uh, Caucasian populations. So first we wanna find out that these modifiable factors actually apply to lots of people and we aren't being confounded by something else. And it turns out that that's true. Whether you look at populations in Africa, Asia, Caucasian populations across North America, across Europe, we still find the same factors come up again and again as being associated with risk for dementia. Another important paper showed that socioeconomically disadvantaged groups have higher dementia rates and lower MMSE scores. But this is mitigated by more education. And it turned out that the area deprivation index, which is a way of measuring um, how uh, resource poor the region is in which somebody lives, was not associated with the pathological burden. So there's this disconnect between the severity of someone's symptoms and the severity of the pathology that they have. And it's in this gap that we have the ability to make a difference. So looking here at a couple of different studies that did exercise interventions. So the first is in just individuals who are at risk for dementia based off of the established risk factors that are out there. They didn't have any symptoms at all. They looked at um, when they made them exercise and they um, followed their cognitive scores over time and they had a slower decline when they exercised. So that's before someone had symptoms. Now moving on to a study from Japan where they looked at individuals with mild cognitive impairment. And when they adhered to exercise regimens, they had beneficial effects both on their cognition and on all these other secondary health things, which I'm fairly focused on the brain, but I think you need a working body to supply the brain with all the fuels it needs. So not a bad thing that we impact things like blood pressure, BMI, dietary habits, et cetera. Um, another study looked at cardiovascular health and um, looked in uh, frontotemporal dementia genetic mutation carriers, both those without symptoms and those with symptoms. And those who had higher cardiovascular health had slower decline in their cognition and lower amounts of white matter burden, which affects, you know, we talked about the pathologies that can alter your disease course. Um, that's one of them. And there was another study that looked at CSF markers of rejuvenation. This was a combination of factors that were both good and bad for you. And they came up with a composite score. And those who had a higher composite score, so more associated with more rejuvenating, um, more rejuvenation, they had slower decline um, and slower functional decline. And they did this in a cohort that had um, mutations associated with frontotemporal dementia, and they also did it in a cohort of um, Alzheimer's disease. And what this tells us is that there are also genetic modifiers um, associated with um, altered disease course. Um, lastly, there's been a number of studies that have looked at the effect of diet, and both the MIND diet, um, which is a more specified, um, and as well as the Mediterranean style diet, which is a little bit looser, have been associated with um, higher cognition and slower decline and lower amounts of pathology. And so what this tells us is it's not just helping the symptoms, but it's actually fundamentally altering disease biology. 
And so here I've illustrated that we've spent a lot of time in the field focusing on diseases of the brain and quantifying the pathology and understanding how it changes over time and understanding how it spreads through the brain and understanding the evolution of symptoms and all of that. And we've really missed how focusing on brain health in many ways can fundamentally bend that curve or alter the way that someone progresses through these diseases. And so by focusing on brain health, we really can change our destiny in the face of these disorders. So hopefully uh, with today's talk, I've uh, convinced you that there is a lot of clinical utility for the use of biomarkers that helps give us better diagnoses, better prognoses, and perform better clinical trials. Um, I've talked a little bit about the change in how we view these disorders, um, moving away from syndromic definitions to pathologically defined diseases, um, and the controversy around that. Um, as well as thinking about how it is that, what are the things that we can do to alter our destiny and take control of our fate? Um, and with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. I'm gonna ask you to wait for the microphone so that our um, participants online can hear you. So I have a two-part question. One is, um, how important would it be for the family members who have dementia, family members' history of dementia, to do a biomarker uh, testing? And the second is that, um, you know, um, the, sometimes the symptoms are not there, as you said, and the biomarkers would be there. Presence of having a biomarker is it inevitably going to lead to the disease? Yeah, so these are two really great questions. The first is, what is the importance of a family history? And the second um, is, if you have a positive biomarker, is are symptoms inevitable? Um, so with respect to the first question, um, we focus a lot on monogenic causes of disease, um, meaning you have a specific genetic change and you will definitely get a disease. Um, and I think that that helps us learn a lot about biology, but it ignores probably what's at play in most individuals in most typical cases of dementia, where the disease itself is probably oligogenic, if not polygenic, meaning that lots of different changes in our genes affect our susceptibility to develop pathology. And then all of our life experiences either add to that susceptibility or take away from that susceptibility. Um, and so we know that in neurodegeneration in general, probably close to half of individuals will report a positive family history. Um, historically, so when I was in training, we used to say 10% of disease was um, what, what's termed familial or genetic, um, which there's a big difference between 10 and 50%. Uh, now I think we've moved the needle a little bit. So we've identified genetic causes in about a quarter of cases, um, but there's still a gap there. And I think that gap is probably reflective of multiple genetic risk factors. Um, so not deterministic genetic changes, but ones that all or your risk, whether increasing or lowering it. Um, with regard to your second question, so all of that is to say that family history matters, um, but it's rare that it's due to a specific mutation and more reflective of a general genetic background that is amenable to the development of pathology um, is one way to think about it. So with regard to your second question, if you have a positive biomarker, are symptoms inevitable? Um, so I, I would argue um, that, that it's a hard question to answer. So there's probably, if we look at autopsy cohorts um, and even um, for the latest biomarkers um, that we can test in vivo, uh, approximately 10% of individuals without symptoms have positive biomarkers. And this was um, done through the Swedish BioFinder study um, and a couple of other large studies that really help sort of figure out where we stand in, in this uh, regard. And it turns out that as a group, those individuals, not cognitively normal by all means, they don't have any concerns, they don't have any symptoms, um, they perform lower on cognitive testing and they change faster over time. And so 
I think that it's not necessarily inevitable that you will progress to dementia. However, it is reflective of a change. And that change is not something we should bury our heads in the sand about and ignore, but it's an opportunity to act on our modifiable risk factors. Oh yeah, sorry. Yes, and click on the QR code to complete the survey, please. I mean, not right this second, we should listen. Well, thank you, Dr. Snyder, for a wonderful talk. And also, Larry, thank you so much for sharing something that's so personal, yet also providing us with this wonderful teaching moment. Um, you know, when you share this diagnosis with me, my heart just sunk. Uh, because I'm a memory disorder specialist who treated Lewy body disease hundreds of times myself. So I know what it's like and what, you know, what we're going through. Um, but also, you know, as a chair, you're my faculty. Also, I'm your friend and colleague in my department. And, uh, and I had to pause for a moment and share it. And, um, and I was thinking, now you've shared this information to a lot of people. And I was wondering if you could provide us with an advice in relation to how to react or how not to react when you share something like this? It's a terrific question. Um, I sort of have the, the, the thought, you know, I, I'm, I'm a lot more than my diagnosis. And I want to be perceived as more than that. Um, The denial phase, it wasn't helpful when everybody else sort of uh, supported that. Um, I want folks to continue to have me as part of their lives. Um, I want to continue to be able to contribute as best I can. I want people to be honest with me and to be responsive to me. Um, you know, part of, I think, what Allison was, was hinting at, certainly you know, the more I, I, as I've worked in psychiatry, the incredible importance of community uh, just keeps emphasizing itself. And uh, so I want my community to continue <laughs> uh, and to be part of that. Fair answer? Best I can. We do have a question on Zoom uh, while other folks in the audience here are thinking about their questions and comments. Um, one question is, which I think probably was sparked by some of those articles in, in popular media, how do we get tested for biomarkers without any symptoms? And is this something that we can request at our friendly doctor's office? <laughs> we know how Dr. Guttmacher requested it. <laughs> yes. So um, the current, so I, I, this is an important point to make. And I think that a point that was really missed by all of the articles in the lay press, which is that the clinical community has set these biomarkers up to be a framework for an age in which we have effective disease modifying therapy. And I think we're really in the Alzheimer's space on the kind of precipice of that with the uh, approval of the monoclonal antibodies against um, amyloid. So that's the Lakembi or Lakanumab and Aduhelm or um, Aducanumab. Um, and there are several others um, with the same mechanism that are going to be approved presumably in the near future. Um, and so right now the recommendation is not to get tested um, if you do not have symptoms uh, because there's not much that we could do in typical clinical practice. 
There are ongoing clinical studies looking at the effect of anti-amyloid therapies in pre-symptomatic individuals. And so in the context of a clinical trial, that would be one way if you were very eager to pursue testing um, that you could consider doing that. But the framework that were set that was set out is really to serve us for the future in many ways, um, not to say that we're exactly ready for it yet. And I think the best way to think about this is how we approach genetic screening in newborns. Um, so there's lots of conditions that we could test for. Maybe some people would even argue that every newborn baby should just get a whole genome sequenced, right? Um, we would have lots of answers then, maybe even all of them or none of them. Um, but the list of tests that we do are really informed by which conditions we can diagnose early and affect change. Um, and so I think right now there's, even though there are opinions in the field about when it is best to start disease modifying therapies, we don't have those answers definitively yet. Um, I think those are forthcoming, you know, in the next five to 10 years, I think the readouts from these clinical trials that are ongoing right now will help inform this a little bit. So um, to give you some background, there is a huge study looking at um, genetic carriers who will develop Alzheimer's disease, and they are giving a subset of these individuals the monoclonal antibodies against amyloid um, and testing that, this hypothesis that the earlier you treat, the better. Um, but because we don't know the answer to that question yet, it's not currently part of clinical practice, nor would it be appropriate to recommend that. I mean, I, I have three takeaways so far. One is that I need a, a lanai in Hawaii. Uh, that I need to get on the mind diet and that I should have exercised yesterday. So those are in, even without biomarkers, those are things that would patently be good for And I have to confess to Dr. Snyder that I have been a very good patient and I've done everything you asked me to do, except for the damn mind Mediterranean <laughs> diet. No. <laughs> there were I have my at dinner last night. <laughs> I will entertain, are there any other, yeah, questions in the audience? Thank you. Hi, um, you mentioned that Dr. Snyder set up a very good environment for you to receive the diagnosis. And I was wondering, maybe from both of you, um, what is it that's important to you when you do provide this diagnosis? Um, and for you as the patient, what's important for you to hear too? It was a weird part of me as a U of R faculty member with this former U of R student and I had this strange, you, you are the most biopsychosocial doc <laughs> I've ever encountered. And it, so the way that, that Allison talked to us, and it was Terry and me together, um, she didn't pull any punches. She was fully straightforward in what was going on. But she was there. She was there for our questions. She was there for our emotional reaction. She was just incredibly accepting and kind um, and made herself very available. Um, so I, you know, I, I've worked with medical students, you know, here's how you deliver bad news. And it was like, you know, she was following the script really well. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> I would say I was taught by the best. Um, and, you know, as I, I firmly believe that knowledge is power. And part of what makes people so fearful of this diagnosis is the sense that there's nothing that they can do. And so when I talk to patients, what I first do is give it a label, which I think is really important for everyone. What is this called? And I try to be as specific as possible. Um, not only is I think therapeutic and in, in that sense alone, but it also helps me give the best advice about what's coming. Um, so I gather all the information I can on all of my patients, which means sending biomarkers on everyone because it informs their prognosis, their diagnosis and their prognosis. Um, so I give it a label, I lay out the data um, and explain how I came to call it what I'm calling it um, so that they can understand a little bit of my process. I talk about um, the expected trajectory because I think it is important to know what's coming. 
um, that gives people the knowledge to plan and fill their life in the way that they want to fill it. And I spend a long time talking about modifiable factors. And I didn't get into this today, but having joy in your life is absolutely one of them. Um, we can measure changes in people's blood in their inflammatory markers when they experience joy. So there's a series of articles in the New York Times about all walks that you can um, look at. And this is work done by a colleague of mine at, at UCSF. Um, and so that's one piece of it. Um, exercise, taking care of your body is important. Um, diet we talked a little bit about and sleep is another important one. And, and these all sound very trivial and very silly. And I am frank with people about that, um, but it turns out that they're impactful. And I think giving people a set of things that they can do um, is really important um, because it takes away that helplessness and hopelessness. Um, that the diagnosis has attached to it. I just want to say, I wish we actually had reserved another hour to have discussion and dialogue. I, I'm very grateful to both of you for the very different perspectives that you brought, one on the science and the other on living with grace and dignity and hopefulness in the midst of what otherwise has been stigmatizing and, and to some really devastating news. Um, I just want to say on behalf of our audience today, uh, what a gift you have given us, both from the scientific perspective, um, as well as from the personal and relationship-oriented one. That is very consistent with what I've always known about you, but there are people in the audience who've known that about you for a very long time. So thank you for continuing to be the stalwart teacher and for giving us the gift of learning through you and with you. And I think we can hold up our end of the bargain that you've requested of us. So. Thank you to both of you for being here today.